As if they don't have too much on their plates The Kings of Combat Sports Podcast, John and Wade They'll talk about the things they did that day They'll analyze the work of Vince and Triple H Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown And it is time for Rewind to Smackdown with Wei Ting, the star, front and center. Hello, Wei. Front and center. I don't know about that. Um, I'm, I'm merely, I would say I'm off to the side, you know, at a 45 degree angle. Because I think at the center of these Friday night reviews is the entire Zoom room. It is crazy here. Uh, just live every Friday night. Really just a preview of, I think, what we can expect. Tomorrow at noon, John, for post podcast day. You said it, Way. The countdown is on the biggest event that you could possibly att- be attracted to this this coming week. It's post podcast day, without question. Everyone else just really playing for that silver medal that's out there because the gold is going to post podcast day, noon Eastern time. We will be going live for six straight hours. Six. Very unique shows coming your way. It's going to be kicking off with Braden Harrington and Davey Portman with worst WrestleMania matches ever. They will be setting the bar. And then following that, we've got shows from the British Wrestling Experience, the Nubian Wrestling Advocates, Turned Out a Punk, a live edition of Ask Away, and our Q and Ariel with Mr. Hawani from ESPN. Q and Ariel. Did you just come up with that? When did, when did that when did you make that up? Way, listen, when you're John Pollock, you've got to be at the cutting edge of wit on a daily basis. So that's that's what I'm calling it now. I I I I love it. Um a very worthy card, a stack lineup. I mean, this is really kind of a a virtual festival, is it not? It is. It is a uh, a very socially distant festival where everyone can join from the comfort of their own home live via video. Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities for listeners, viewers to uh, interact and, and join in. The The chat room shall be fire, as one would say. But not fi- not like fire fest. Not like that kind of festival. No, no. We're promising no accommodations, no food, none of that that sort. So that really is. We, we promise our voices, our faces, and that's about it. Mm-hmm. That's right. So yeah, all... So- and... Because of uh, this big event that's coming out, uh, for that reason, this edition is a free edition of Rewind to SmackDown for all of our listeners out there. So if you're someone that listens, if you're just a a Monday, Wednesday follower, and all of a sudden you're waking up on Saturday morning, and holy Christ, there's another show from John and Way. Well, consider this your, your birthday present, no matter when you were born, because it all begins later today at noon. We hope to see you there. Yeah, no, we did not make a mistake. We want you to hear this so that you may be able to join us Saturday afternoon. So it is live and available for all Post Wrestling Cafe patrons, which is, of course, our Patreon, postwrestlingcafe.com. Support the Post Wrestling Network and get access to not just Post Podcast Day, but our Rewind of Smackdown every single Friday, live for all patrons. Uh, rewind away our entire archive. We've got 83 of these things right now. Just did one about Brian Pillman that John and I are both very happy with. And of course, MCU later, which will arrive Saturday evening with me, WH Park, and sh- 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 special guest Shane McDonough talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Plus, I think we're at something like 400 bonus shows right now in our archive. Oh my God. So, something like that. So you get access to all that just for $6 a month. Access to me and Way's entire Entire conversations from the past three years. Everything is documented. Everything. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, quite the catalog of our uh, voice voices. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so check out all of that. There's some great stuff coming up. Uh, it's going to be obviously packed over the next week. Uh, we won't get into all of the, the WrestleMania week uh, stuff yet. But suffice to say, there will be a lot of stuff uh, next week. Coming your way, uh, whether you are a cafe member, a free listener, lots and lots of stuff uh, coming up this weekend and into next week through WrestleMania and the month of April. So a great time to jump on to the cafe if you are so inclined. 
Is that enough? Yeah. Is, that good, is that a good hard sell? I think so. I think so. Enjoy the rest of the show, everybody, including uh, you people in the Zoom room right now, where, where we'll be getting to your calls in a bit. Yes. Hang tight. After SmackDown, we'll be opening up the phone lines. But let's go through. There's a bit of news to get to. And let's start off with the a very interesting announcement that on WrestleMania Sunday, the WWE Network will be releasing the latest edition of the Broken Skull Sessions, where Steve Austin will be interviewing AEW's Chris Jericho. How did this come together, Way? Well, in speaking to SI.com, Steve Austin said, I was having a beer one night after my Broken Skull Sessions interview with The Undertaker aired, and out of the blue, Chris Jericho reached out and said, man, that was a great interview. And Austin says, I sent him back a couple of those emojis, one of a beer mug and the other of an eagle. And then he called me right then and there. And way that began the dialogue that led to Vince McMahon saying, sure. And Tony Khan saying, cool. And they're going to do an interview on the WWE network next weekend. I think it's a very smart move on their part. Um, Part of me is like kind of it's it's not uh, surprising, but it's more so to like today. Uh, uh, Paul Levesque was doing his media call, and he was actually asked about this, and he had not heard about this news item yet that Jericho was going to be on. So he's kind of be reacting in real time, and his he's just pretty much saying, "Well, like of course," and he's alluding to the fact that you know people make up this stuff in their mind, uh, stuff that's really not there to begin with. It's like of course Vince is fine with this and such. It's like. You have crafted this, uh, it's like, it's when it's suitable for you, this is something that you can exploit and it's a big deal. It's like an AEW guy on the WWE network. It's, um, it, it's just funny when it's like, oh, it's like everyone's, uh, cool with everyone. But then when you want to create a buzz for something, it certainly benefits them to have this. And th- I think this is a very savvy move on their part for that weekend that, uh, no, this is going to attract interest on a super busy weekend for WWE. This is one other thing that, if for nothing else, people are going to be curious to see what is or what is not addressed in a lengthy Steve Austin interview with Chris Jericho. Yeah, I I mean, I, I don't maybe, I don't necessarily think it's it, it would be a fabricated story that, you know, it went down the way that it did. And it, because it's, this is Steve Austin, I think he has considerable... Uh, level of you know influence in determining you know what types of things he gets to do within the company and uh, the story like you know that simply sending a text first of all what I get the beer emoji what why the eagle emoji um I don't know does Jericho have an eagle tattoo I don't know eagle okay interesting anyway but you know these two are friends. They have a shared history. He's his, most of his wrestling history is tied to that company. Uh, a move like this definitely is a surprise. But maybe given, uh, like, ultimately, how much does this affect things? I don't think it affects anything. Oh, nothing. It's just it's it, it's a smart move if you're um, Peacock and WWE that this is going to be something that is interesting for people to watch. And I think just how like. Of late, like these Broken Skull sessions, they're very much have become, you know, like career retrospectives for the subject. So AEW is going, you have to cover AEW. I don't know how much of it it will, but I'm very interested to see, is, does AEW provide footage for this interview? To see, be that would be a surprise. That I don't know if I expect, you know, I, I mean, there's clearly plenty of to talk about with his career lasting up until a certain point in the WWE whether or not they get into uh, New Japan, whether they, or not they get into AEW, that would be a surprise to me. You have to get into AEW. You can't do a tease like this and it's all <laughs> life ends at the Greatest Royal Rumble in 2018. It's you have to talk about AEW or else this would be uh, a massive waste. And I don't think Austin or Jericho, it's it's more so interesting how how they handle it because there's, you know, there's certain areas it'll just be an interesting interview to see where they navigate and i think you've seen certain interviews where austin i mean we recently did the vince mcmahon interview and it was very interesting that was years and years ago of just how he approached certain subjects with vince mcmahon that you knew were going to be addressed that was in the wake of all of the cm punk interview with colt cabana 
And this is one that, I mean, they're doing it for a reason and you have to go into certain AEW stuff. I think it's a really smart move to do this kind of thing. Um, for AEW, it's like, I, I think like no harm, no foul. Who cares? It's, uh, well, it's to a me, benefit to them. It's, uh, I think it's yeah. smart for both sides and you're going to have people that are on, on one of the busiest weekends of the year. This is something that there will be people that try and I think set aside some time on that Sunday to watch this. Uh, I don't know if I will be, but that will be uh, just such an insane day to begin with. But this is, I, I think it's a really smart move. And I, I thought the teaser that they put out today was just great. Just the video, um, the just doing the, the tease yesterday with the Jericho countdown sound effects and releasing it today, not yesterday, probably a smart move. So you don't get the April Fool's stupidity. Yes. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. No. It was, the, uh, the worst day of the year, but I digress. It's pretty bad. Did you get caught much? Or no? No. You just stay away no. from social media all day? Um, I stay away from social media most days, but I just, it's a day I just, I, I think it's just stupidity at its finest. Who do you, who do you think this opens the door for uh, to, to appear on the WWE Network and, you know, an Austin interview that you wouldn't expect? I, I, I wouldn't look at, um, AEW necessarily being an avenue that they're going to get a frequent funnel of guests. I think this is a very specific one with a guy who has a, a tied history to WWE and is more so a one, like I would not expect others like this to be some kind of sign, but it's one where I think it at least gives you an open mind that it doesn't have to be WWE contracted talent that are going like, this is going to get a lot more buzz than say Randy Orton of a few weeks ago even though that was a very good interview. But I think this is what you're looking for on Peacock. You're looking for events that are going to create buzz. And this is one of them. Mm -hmm. Moving on to uh, some ratings notes. Uh, Before we get into AEW and Impact, uh, we do have a correction from uh, Wednesday when uh, Showbuzz Daily had been... So Impact did not finish in the top 150 cable programs. So um, the site then noted when asked that Impact did... 38,000 viewers, and we talked about this Wednesday, that it almost seemed like this had to be an error. It turned out it was an error, and in fact, the show did actually very good uh, viewership-wise. They were actually up uh, with their best viewership since February with 148,000 viewers and a .04 in the 18 to 49 demographic. So that made a lot more sense than that staggeringly low figure from uh, this past Tuesday's episode. Uh, But for AEW and NXT on Wednesday, uh, the second to last head to head battle between uh, now, uh, now best friends on the broken skull sessions, AEW and WWE, AEW did 700,000 viewers and a 0.26 in the key demo. So this was their second lowest numbers of the year uh, with the lowest being that night of all the news coverage, the day of the attack on the Capitol back on January 6th. NXT uh, closed the gap within 50,000 viewers. They did 654,000, 12th for the night on cable, and a .21 in the 18 to 49 demo, up 50% from last week. And it was a case of NXT uh, showing some incredible increases. And of the key demos, they beat out AEW uh, slightly, but beat them out in women 18 to 49, adults 18 to 34. Uh, which, again, that makes last week's SmackDown, this week's Raw, and NXT all shows that did very well in the 18-34 to 34 demo. All three of them this week did very well. Uh, they also beat out AEW in men 12-34 to 34 and winning out in 50+. plus. Although, 50+, plus was down 20% this week for NXT. So, again, like Raw, um, their over 50 audience was down and that uh, affected their number. If this was a higher-than-usual... Uh, 50 plus number or, or if NXT what did what they did last week in that demo uh, this would have been a very close overall viewership pattern but I think the story this week was that uh, AEW did not really spike a number uh, with what they had advertised even with the the long buildup of arcade anarchy like it turned out well but it didn't seem like that was a big attraction for people or Christian's the first quarter though it did do very well so that should be said for Christian's match with Frankie Kazarian but uh, overall I mean those were the key things advertised but I'm kind of surprised that NXT did as well as they did this week um everything's peaking for next week uh this week it kind of just had the battle royal but obviously there was something about this show with NXT that this week they 
they certainly um, narrowed the gap as they go into their final head-to-head contest next week. Seems like there's some good momentum behind NXT as they close up this Wednesday chapter. Um, maybe, you know, I, I think the cards are really strong for both takeovers next week. And if the programs are strong, I could see there being an increased interest in the stories. I liked NXT for the most part on Wednesday. That teaser for the prime target was so awesome. I thought that was one of the best videos I have seen in a long time for anything pro wrestling related. I was just so captivated by that video. I thought it was excellent. Well, there's so much real life history between the two and all it really requires is a great production team to be able to tie it all together. So that prime target to me immediately becomes one of the very, you know, must see things uh, in next week's very packed schedule that I'm going to make time for. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sean Ryan was, uh, you know, behind that video. And I think, you know, people that have followed his work pr- prior uh, with with OTT, I think you can uh, see the, an extremely talented e- editor. Um, other things on the show I really liked. I thought Tommaso Ciampa's promo was really solid ahead of the, the Walter match. And w- what are your thoughts on the uh, the Tian Sha uh, introduction and where, where this is going? Because I... I think this is, to me, territory that's going to turn off a lot of people. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, in wrestling and really in any promotion, save, you know, maybe a, a DDT or something like that. But it's definitely getting into territory that's very fiend-like, where there's too much um, uh, of an ask of suspension of disbelief, maybe too much sci-fi, not um, enough, you know, groundedness. And it's getting that way for me. Like, I'm somebody who can enjoy maybe the ridiculousness of a lot of these angles but i don't know if that's the tone you want for nxt i don't know if sort of ironic funny is what you're looking for but it's definitely getting there my last question for nxt way is that if you and i ever decided to uh, have a falling out okay and then you had to come on and do a podcast and all of a sudden this post little coaster fell would you be so distracted by it that you'd lose a match maybe a post armband would that be too yeah. distracting? Well, it depends how distraught I was over our breakup, I would say. Yeah. Um, anything c- could set you off. Yeah, some of the storytelling in, in some of these, like that Roddy match, which was a great match, but the finish was a little too melodramatic, I, I think, for pro wrestling standards. Um, or at least for NXT standards, I should say. Um, other than that, I, I, I did think they set things up, uh, really nicely for the two. T- I'm looking forward to those shows next week. I mean, you're going to get some like dynamite matches and it, uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, uh, the chat room really wants us to talk about the dog, <laughs> the oh, dog. Why? Um, it's okay. Well, the, the I think everyone's so- assuming this is just like, yeah, Ty of Valkyrie coming in. Well, why is because the dog is adorable, first of all. And, it's a very, uh, very adorable dog. I really, disagree. really, really stole the show, I thought, for many people. You know, the buzz coming off of that show. So oh. we look forward to the dog's debut. Not, I mean, Ty Valkyrie is great, but more so, I, I'm looking forward to the dog. Okay. Um, didn't AEW do that once? The Like the puppy bull or something like that? Oh, yeah, they did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So interpromotional down the road, potentially. Sure. All right. Uh, so next week, TakeOver, the first night, It's we mentioned it'll be simulcast on Peacock, and Paul Levesque noting today that the Peacock version will be commercial-free. So they're, they're putting the big impetus on people that if you have Peacock, you want to be watching it on, on Peacock as opposed to USA next week. So they're very much driving you towards Peacock. Uh, I'm just looking at this card way, and you know, usually NXT has your like 8 to 10-minute overrun. These five matches that they have next week, Io and Raquel, Walter versus Ciampa, the six-person gauntlet eliminator match, uh, the three-way tag team title match, and now you've added Pete Dunne and Kushida. Um, That's going to be a real task to fit this into two hours and change. Uh, And if you're adding in commercial breaks, um, God, I would definitely want to watch the commercial-free version of these matches. Definitely. Yeah, it'll be tough. And some of these matches, I really wish they... I really hope that they get enough time, you know, with a TV format. But I think, you know, the idea is to try to put everybody into a significant match on the show and to um, 
you know, to, like stack the lineup so that you they make sure that you watch or subscribe to Peacock. All right, let's uh, move on. Just a few more notes here. Uh, we have uh, WrestleMania week. Uh, some of the things uh, that they have, they put out the whole schedule for next week. So some of the highlights include uh, the prime target special will be next Tuesday. That's the same day as the hall of fame. We've got two nights of the takeover pre-shows, which uh, did you hear that Jimmy Smith is going to be one of the, the panelists on here? Heard. Yeah. So very there, exciting. There you go. Uh, and then uh, it's going to be one hour kickoff shows for both nights of WrestleMania. Music to my ears that we're not getting the two hour kickoff panel. Yeah. I mean, that would really burn a lot of people out. Um, so, yeah, one hour. I, I think mean, we'll that's get still a long time. It's, it, yeah. I mean, I guess it'll be interesting to see if, given that it's only the one hour window, uh, are they going to put a match on the kickoff? Are they going to save all the matches for the main show or um, just. They have usually the- have at least one match and an hour kickoff. Usually, yeah, I guess we'll we'll see we'll see what they do here. But anyway, that's that's the whole lineup for well, not all of it, but the whole lineup is up on the site if people want to check that out. Man, I know that next week is going to be insane, but now that we're just days away from WrestleMania week and all the stuff that's going on next week, it is utter insanity. Which takes us to our final story way. It's an MMA one. So you know it's for you. Are you familiar way? And I ask this honestly because your answer may be yes. Prior to Thursday night, were you familiar with Hitag Pliev? Of course. Yeah, I, yes. co- I did a, a thing about him uh, for the Olympics. Yeah. I knew that. I knew this. So okay. Hitag Pliev uh, is a Russian fighter who competed uh, on the, was it the Greco Roman team for Team Canada at the 2012 games? Yeah, it was one of the wrestling teams. Yeah. So he was fighting on Thursday night for CFFC, which is the group that uh, CM Punk does commentary for. And the show was taking place from the former ECW arena in Philadelphia. And in the second round, it was discovered that he tagged Pliev's ring finger was missing. His finger was missing. Somehow during this fight, his finger was detached from the hand. So they are searching for this finger. There's even an announcement for people to look for this finger. Then it was discovered (laughs) the severed finger was in his glove. This dude, this dude wanted to continue. It ends up being a TKO loss for Hitag Pliev, who was still willing to just wait in the cage for the official uh, announcement but before they sent him off, he went to the hospital. They reattached the finger. This is one of the most insane stories I've ever heard in MMA history. And the pressure that is now on Hitag Pliev to come up with the most clever nickname is officially on. <laughs> that is insane. That's a crazy, crazy story. And I guess uh, an example of um, what adrenaline can do for somebody in the middle of a fight. That is nuts. I I read the story in your update. I did not put I did not realize that that was the same person that I instantly uh, knew. Story. I instantly knew this name because we had I, I was not involved with the story, but I knew that you had been. So when I heard this name, I'm like, "Wait a minute. I absolutely know that name." Oh god. Well, he is a beast of a wrestler. Uh, I haven't really caught up with him since then, but um I mean, I guess a tough guy, you know. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> like I, he, dude, he was willing to continue. It's like, oh, it's, yeah. I've got nine others. That's insane. Wow. Just an utter, utter insane story. And there was CM Punk to, uh, to call it. So there you go. That's <laughs> in his glove. He found Man. the finger in his glove. It's like, guys, I found it. <laughs> like, you know, we, I, I, I wait like a combat sports, like a, the next Rocky, <laughs> like doing, doing some sort of parody of this. Man, I, yeah, I did not have words. I also like the video was circulating. This is a video I did not need to watch. I just, I, I don't oh. want to, I, I saw the photos. The photos were enough for me. I didn't need the, uh, the video. This really should have been the finish for like the Rey Mysterio, uh, I, I storyline, you <laughs> a know, finger, finger for, yeah. Like a where's five my finger eye? Dis- five <laughs> finger discount ma- match. Yeah. Where's the eye? Oh, it's in the mask this whole time. <laughs> I want to keep fighting. 
My God. I mean, you're right. There is some parallels here to that Rollins Rey Mysterio feud. Maybe they were ahead of their time. All right. Uh, with that, you can go catch all of the news up at postwrestling.com. Uh, news today coming out uh, from our guest tomorrow, Ariel Hawani, that Dustin Poirier has signed his bout agreement. It looks like Poirier and Conor McGregor expected for July 10th. Uh, lots of news up on the site. And we now transition to Friday Night Smackdown. So this was the final show that they were taping at Tropicana Field because next week's SmackDown has been taped. Next week's Raw has been taped. And so they had to do tonight's show when next week's has already been taped. So this was uh, probably some uh, mind trickery that everyone had to engage in to, uh, to do all of this. It was probably better in most cases. They well, they knew where they were going next week. So that's, that's helpful. Yeah. Well, goodbye to the Tropicana Field. What an era it was. What what an era it was, yes. Um, I'm going to miss the um, ceiling, you know, and that backstage um, uh, grant floor. It was um, it was a wonderful, wonderful scenery. Uh, the, Ying, the Yingling Center has a lot to live up to. Yes, yes. Edge came out to start the show. And compared Daniel Bryan to Roadkill, uh, not the wrestler, and weaseled his way into my main event at WrestleMania. Bryan allowed Edge to think that his comeback was possible and was intrigued to team with Bryan at Fastlane. But I was too focused on Reigns, and Bryan was this manipulator and opportunist that me of all people should have seen coming. He realizes he got outplayed, but he finally likes what he's seeing in the mirror. So he's going to come out swinging doing whatever is necessary with his back against the wall. Finally, the rated R superstar has awoken. He is a man that Reigns and Brian aspire to. I'm a Hall of Fame legend. I'm the rated R superstar. And those chair shots last week felt so good. And next time, when I have the chance at the concerto, I'm not going to hesitate. So this is Angry Edge, who was angry all show long. You know, I really can't imagine that this was a story this man thought he was going to be telling at the beginning of this year on his way to WrestleMania. You know, I'm going to win the Rumble. I'm going to come in. Then I'm going to turn heel in a three-way match against Roman and Daniel Bryan. I can't imagine that. This man who had such a hatred for triple threat matches that it will change his moral fiber. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. But I, I do think Edge has done a great job of trying to navigate this rather abrupt heel turn. Um, doing his best, I think, to make the change in character feel logical and believable rather than just somebody, you know, doing something for the sake of, like, you know, the creator certainly suddenly wanting something different. Um, he, he, you know, he was really good here. Yeah, I, I, and I he's thought a, this He's week- a great promo. I mean, there's mm-hmm. no disputing that. I'm, I'm going to find it, though, hilarious if he comes out at WrestleMania and gets a hero's response from that crowd. Like, they all cheer him. I think we overestimate like how loud this crowd will be, you know, like that'll be something I think we'll find out immediately, maybe even on the kickoff, whether or not there's going to be any sort of crowd manipulation um, or whether or not, you know, this kind of spaced out crowd will even be audible enough to make a big difference. Uh, And I also I don't really anticipate it on like, you know, the first weekend back. But I, and especially because Brian is such a beloved baby face and they've done a good job of making you d- dislike edge. I lo- I thought this was like a more of a gradual kind of tweener edge than we saw maybe in previous weeks. And I definitely think it's more realistic for him suddenly, you know, gradually turning into a full-time heel rather than, you know, yeah, like it, it, this instead of that. So I thought he was good. And then in the back, he was asked about tonight's street fight that they've announced between Jay Uso and Brian. And Edge won't feel bad if Brian gets beaten senseless tonight and affects his standing at WrestleMania. The Alpha Academy, Chad Gable and Otis, are in the ring. And Gable says that he has transformed this human bulldozer into a force of nature and unleashed his inner Alpha. When they peak, they peak hard. And then we transition to next Friday's show, which they are promoting as the WrestleMania special edition of SmackDown. So next week's show will feature the Fatal 4-Way for the tag titles and the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. So that will all take place on next week's SmackDown. And Gable and Otis are dedicating this title victory next week for the Academy. Uh, I like it. Yeah, a match that I guess they've already taped. 
they had last night. Yeah, they've yeah. They, they've taped next week's show, so this is all in the bag. And these guys, it, it's amazing though when you think about it that Rey Mysterio will not have a WrestleMania spot. It's amazing when you look at the lineup of talent that they have on their roster. Um, and you know, unfortunately, not everybody's going to get a match on the pay per view, and I think that's good because I'd rather you space these things out on your TV rather than you know inflating this the uh, either of the pay per view nights to be it's definitely not a throwaway show next week like they're promoting next week smackdown to be a big show that you're you know getting like two kind of bonus matches so to speak for wrestlemania uh so we had promos from the others uh the other teams involved the dirty dogs and then we go backstage to ray and dominic and we defer to the young mysterio who got to talk tonight way pops Being able to share the ring has been a dream of mine since I was a little kid. I could not ask for a better teacher. And Ray says, I couldn't ask for a better son. This is a beautiful moment between these two. How could you not be rooting for these two to win the tag titles together, father and son? I hope they win, and I hope they have their own talking segment uh, every single week, just so that we can get more of those recaps. I'm hoping that they win the tag titles. And they keep defending them. And then they have that pay-per-view in June that falls on Father's Day, I hope. And they lose. Ooh. And then, good idea. Yes. We get the, the heel turn from Dom that we've all been awaiting for. Yes. Ooh. Wow. You're not my real dad. <laughs> Thanks, Pops. This is the end of our association. <laughs> Pops. Pops. Are you a are you somebody who says pops? Pops? Yeah. No. No. How many people say pops? Uh like everyone in Riverdale. Life? Oh, they do. Like is that just a thing of a certain part of the world or is it just a era? I didn't know um, anyone that referred to their father as uh pops. pops. That, no, yeah. some, some. I I I've heard, yeah, I've heard do. it occasionally. Well, what point do you transition to pops? Because I don't imagine people say pops like you know when they're at the age of two or three, you know, with their first words. Um, like what? What? What did you call your father? Did you have anything beyond dad? Um. Well, it, yeah, it would be in Cantonese, so it wouldn't be pops. I'll tell you that. See, I got to the point where I just transitioned and started calling my dad by his first name. Really? Yeah. Wow. Did it feel natural to you? Like, did he? Did, was he taking? I, I, I like, usually did it as a joke, and then I just kind of assumed it. So, just and ran with he's it. He's cool with it. All right, oh, he, cool. Yeah. I mean, Why don't it. you try pops next time? Pops. Hey, pops. <laughs> I hey, pops. Reaction. <laughs> I have to do my Stallone voice. Uh, and then Angela Dawkins said that tonight they're teaming with the Flying Familia against Rudolph Butterbean and Napoleon. Okay. Quite the collection. Butterbean. Yeah. Undefeated yeah. WrestleMania legend. A, a guy with a very storied uh, background in pro wrestling. Yes. So we had an eight-man tag, and Michael Cole asked Corey Graves the pressing question that this eight-man brings about. Corey, can you build momentum for next week in a match like this? Corey thought about it, and then... Decided, yes, you can build momentum in an eight-man tag for a fatal four-way match. <laughs> so it's high, high-class analysis. Uh, anyway, they built up to a hot tag. Montez Ford just looked fantastic here. Uh, he hit a tope con hero, and then he's in the ring with Gable. Uh, these two were having uh, a nice sequence together. Gable moved out of the way uh, from the heavens, hit the chaos theory. But then, uh, with Ford down, selling the, uh, the suplex, Otis hit the flying bulldozer which is a splash off the middle rope and pin Ford in 933. So hmm. a bulldozer and a Ford, two vehicles colliding. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I thought this was a fun multi-man tag and I guess we can expect much of the same next week. So, you know, when you let wrestlers just kind of do their thing, the results tend to be pretty good. So I just hope that these eight get enough time. Yeah. You have to battle, of course, the commercial interruptions that TV comes with, but you would think that they're going to get probably more time than would be allotted elsewhere. So, I mean, that that's the good and the bad of this being on next Friday's show because this 
th- these eight should have a really entertaining match next week. Uh, Heyman meets up with Adam Pierce and Sonya Deville and suggests a hold harmless agreement for Jay so he's not held responsible for whatever he does to Daniel Bryan tonight. And Pierce goes to interject, but Deville thinks it's a great idea. Mm-hmm. Out comes Seth Rollins in this ridiculous purple tie dye suit, and he he has invested a good deal of money into these suits. So total waste. I think this he- I think this heel turn is this heel run is going to last until he at least debuts all of them on TV once. Oh, the suits. Yeah, I think he's just. I think he's just put himself into such a like silly comedic heel persona. Um, I mean, these guys are going to have an excellent match, but I'm. I can't say I'm a, a fan of this this character uh, of Seth Rollins. It feels very um, too punchliney to take serious in any form or fashion. But um, that said, uh, we had a face to face with Cesaro, and Cesaro was asked about beating Rollins, and he said that this time around there's something different in the air. And then the man began singing, "Swing is in the air." Everywhere you look, and God bless Cesaro. He tried his best here, but what the hell was this? Well, this was an attempt to give the man a personality. Um, God, you know they've they've done a, I think a very deliberate job of not having Cesaro speak this entire feud, and. I would say it's worked pretty well, you know, keeping his uh, appearances to his physicality, just coming in, delivering the uppercuts, delivering the, the swing. Um, man, the verbiage here was so bad. And uh, I think this really exposed him because his delivery was definitely not good enough to overcome it. I mean, he didn't have to sing with his mouth guard in, so that's a help. He didn't yodel either. So we're <laughs> oh taking, ba- taking baby steps. <laughs> Remember that? The yodeling. Yeah. Holy shit. This stuff that I just discard. Rollins went over all these classic mania moments. Um, the mega powers exploding. Stuff that you can still access on Peacock. Uh, Cesaro knows that he can beat Rollins at WrestleMania and embarrass him. You are unshakable, but you are not unswingable. And Rollins snaps at this. It was like just really comedic. And then when Cesaro stood up to him... Rollins back down. I mean, th- these guys are going to kill it in their match, but man, this was... <laughs> listen listen to us having to like... Defend just kind of justify this shit, right? This TV is so bad, like we're just forcing ourselves to overlook it because we know in, 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 the, in the base core of what these two can do in ring. Um, you know, that's... It, it, it's it's going to be way better than this build. Um the build's been fine. They've been trying to, like, you know, craft the story over Rollins getting upset about the swing. Um, I I think for the most part, it's been okay. But this week, I think, was a definite fumble. And in my opinion, if Cesaro's push is going to continue after this, I really think he's going to have to learn how to make this bad material work on a weekly basis. Because he's this is how they make TV. They write stupid shit for you. And um, I don't know if... He is good enough to overcome stuff like this on a weekly basis. I would disagree that him being a like singing badly here would ensure that like if he was great, boom, you're saddled with this. You're you're the singing dude now. So yeah. maybe he avoids that from this segment not being too memorable. It, it all depends on whether or not the person in the back liked this or not. That's beautiful. Frank fucking Sinatra out there. Jazz and Baszler run into, um, did you catch the identity here? This woman backstage? I believe it was Carmella. Can you confirm that? It's been a while. She was there and Nia Jax noting that you didn't treat my guy too well. And everyone probably had a five second gap of piecing this all together and remember, oh yeah, right. Reginald, Carmella left now with Nia. So Shayna Baszler and Natalia, I won't even say had a match. They like briefly interacted. Uh, Natalia went for an inside cradle. Natalia, sorry, Natalia went for the cradle. Baszler reversed it. 
Natalia reversed it back and caught her. 35 seconds and pinned the dangerous sh- shooter, Shayna Baszler. Uh, I just thought, man, I can't wait when there's gold at stake because this could have been a title change under different circumstances. I am really, my interest is peaked. Yeah, I I get wanting to move the show along, especially for like maybe a match that people had, didn't have too much interest in, but this is Shayna Baszler. You know, she is the most legitimate person they have in this division. And beyond that, I thought this was a match that I was actually looking forward to between these two. Um, I mean, ultimately it doesn't matter, but my greater concern is that this is where they continue to view Shayna. You know, that she's, she's going somebody, to this week. That she's somebody expendable there to take falls for Nia Jax. And, you know, I, I don't know if this bodes well for maybe her future status as where I see her as like a leader in the division. Well, Carmella is watching this in the back. Jackson Baszler attack Natalia and Tamina. The Riot Squad get involved. Then, uh, with the Kirafuda clutch onto Ruby, they get stopped by Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke entering, followed by Lana and Naomi. Now, at least on Monday with King Corbin, they explain that, you know, he's trying to take up this bounty that Lashley's put out. I mean, okay, whatever. The, the brand split is what it is. Uh, but then this, I mean, it's like, we're not even trying anymore. Yeah. What? I mean, I don't even care to think about it that hard. I suppose like there are no rankings. There's really, they have, I think loosely tried to get everybody into contention by having everybody pin everybody else and Shayna taking most of those pinfalls as well. So I think if you look back in their cage match records, I'm sure each one might have a justifiable reason to enter this, but not that we really needed it. Did know? this count as the quarterly brand to brand invitational? They never explain that, and I don't think they will. So, um, yeah, I guess the quarterly brand invitational also is acceptable when somebody just puts a bounty on somebody, or you have WrestleMania coming up. Okay. So there you go. The The quarter gets extended a little bit. Um, I guess we just started a new quarter, so maybe this, this covers them for the next three months. Uh, sure, I guess so. Yeah. And so I'm assuming every team we – they didn't announce the match yet, but it's likely these teams for night one and then the winners challenging Baszler and Jax on night two. And I guess the only question is, is if – Carmella gets inserted into this because afterwards, uh, Billy Kay approached her with her CV and Carmella held on to it with the resume. So I guess teasing that maybe there'll be a team thrown together here and maybe they'll throw in some other teams. You have like Peyton Royce hanging around. Anyone else? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it seems, seems somewhat likely. Um, it also just maybe seems like a, another version of the Battle Royal that they usually do, except for the tag team titles. Um no, I hope they get enough time to have a good match. But with so many bodies, it's maybe not likely. Logan Paul arrived in his limo. Sami Zayn is going out of his mind. Uh, they promoted for Raw on Monday. Bobby Lashley versus Cedric Alexander. Drew McIntyre versus King Corbin. And the big one, Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax versus Asuka and Rhea Ripley in a non-title match. He, oh, it's a non-title match. Okay, well, that's good. Then Sami Zayn is in this goofy tuxedo. He puts over Logan Paul as a YouTube star, a podcaster, a boxer, but most importantly, a social media influencer. And out comes Logan Paul. Zayn is just doing this ridiculous dance. He actually found a tuxedo that rivaled uh, Rollins for worst dressed on this show. But for Zayn, it, it's it's definitely better fitting. It looked very good on him, yeah. It's and uh, insulating too. Man, it was sweating up a storm. Well, that adds the the paranoid character should be sweating. He says that Logan being here will show his followers this is not a conspiracy theory; it's truth. Zane says I'm surrounded by brain dead drone corporate hacks twenty four seven. I appreciate your open mind, Logan, and he invites Logan to be his guest at WrestleMania. Uh, and Logan Paul, who had already spoiled this on his own podcast, that he will be at WrestleMania. Yeah, well, 
I, I don't think they can get too mad at him over that. So we throw to the trailer, which is rated T for truth. <laughs> Pro- produced by Voracious Pictures. And I think this thing was, was pretty funny. It's Zane just talking about all his paranoia, the referees that are out to get him that have led to a strange dislike of zebras that he is having nightmares about. Uh, he's asked about being a flat earther, the effects it's having on his psyche, and the documentary Justice for Sammy is coming soon. So I'm, I see this trailer and I, I, I don't know if there's much of a semblance of an actual story here. Like, it just seems like it's a collage of, you know, footage that they these camera crews have shot over the past weeks. Um, so I don't really know what to expect if we're actually even going to get a full length feature. Well, Logan Paul is not as convinced about the the uh, viability of this documentary. He said like a lot of work went into it and said it's compelling. But earlier, Kevin Owens approached him. He said, I've known Sami Zayn for 15 years, uh, which I mean, these two have known each other longer than that. Um, and says there is no conspiracy theory. And Sami Zayn is neurotic. Zayn gets upset. You're my guest of honor. But he calms down and he doesn't want Kevin Owens to poison Logan Paul's mind. And then out of nowhere, Kevin Owens appears, stuns Zane, and then shoves Logan Paul aside as Owens makes his exit and is sporting his KO Mania 5 shirt. The KO powers implode. Yeah. That was the segment. How would you think Logan Paul fared here? I thought Sami Zayn largely carried this segment. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's very funny. Um... I think Logan Paul is like did what he you know was required to do, show his face literally his appear. Name. Yeah, lend his name to the program and to WrestleMania. It seems like you know an, a late addition or a mutually beneficial celebrity interaction. You think he does any spots? I think you have to do something with him. I'm sure he'd be down to do something physical. Do you think the audience looks at him as a baby face or a heel? Ah, uh, Logan Paul is such a natural heel. I don't know why you would possibly try to make this guy a baby face, which is kind of how they tried to portray him here. They just kind of booked him as like, you know, any celebrity that I guess you know, people would assume would be beloved. I think it's a great spot if it ends where w- whatever you stunner. want to do, Logan Paul eats the stunner at the end. That should be yeah. the spot, I think. Yeah. Pierce and DeVille get approached by Edge. He says that Adam Pierce made the worst decision in WWE history, changing the main event to a triple threat. The worst decision in WWE history. What would you say is the actual worst? Oh boy. Um, We could be here all night. He says, though, in defense, the street fight is a very good idea. And he'll be on commentary for the match. Owens got interviewed, but then he was jumped by Sami Zayn backstage. So I I saw uh, they played a Hall of Fame commercial here and they did acknowledge like all the names that are going to be a part of it or at least they showed footage and it's a big class you know you have from last year of course and this year with jbl the bellas the nwo they showed jushin liger they showed oh, the they Bulldog. did show liger okay mm-hmm. william shatner ozzy osbourne kane molly bischoff Kali. ozzy RBD. osbourne okay yeah had they announced yeah. ozzy osbourne last year i don't, I don't think so i think i think shatner was was shatner announced last year no shatner was this year Oh, okay. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, why not? Um, yeah. The, the, you heard about the, the Bellas deal was they had a 15 minute speech and they were told three to five minutes for them, mm-hmm. which I mean, just for the, I, God knows why they're doing this marathon list of inductions this year. Um, part of me feels like, the Hall of Fame is what it is, but for some of the, I, I remember the back when uh, the year in Houston where they they put in Dory Funk Jr. and Terry Funk together, and they were given the same. It was like five minutes for these two and their careers to be summed up. It's like there's a lot of fans that will defend and put this Hall of Fame over, but then it's it's kind of like on the other hand, like this at, at its very core, this is what the WWE. It's a television event, and I think you always had the best analogy of not equating this to a quote-unquote Hall of Fame. Imagine they're saying, we're making a DVD on this person. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. That's what this is. Um, yeah. I, uh, 
It, these you know, are a what, lot of speeches, though, dude. Like, even if they try to like, keep these to five what, minutes, this is a lot of speeches. It's like, what's the alternative? You don't give 30 minutes to every, everybody? Like, it's just not possible. Well, the alternative wouldn't be to have so many people enter a class, but... I, th- I think so. I, th- yeah. I think that could be it. Uh, who knows why they decided to, to, like, cram the two classes into one whole show this year, but, you know, these are kind of being treated like, um, you know, like the Oscars. Like, the Oscars, for many people, any, anytime they win one of those awards, it's like, it's the, it's the crowning achievement of, of their lifetimes, but they might get, what, a minute to thank everybody they want? This will be, unfortunately, somewhat similar. For most people. I mean, I do think, like, your headliners are going to maybe, you know, get a bit more time. And who do you think headlines? Who do you put on last? Um, I can see Kane, maybe. He's a big enough name. NWO, I don't think so, because, like, they've all gone in individually. I could still see them going, being put on last. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, without Batista, it kind of opens it up that you could end, you could end with the NWO, I guess, I guess Kane, I guess when you think about it, why not? Yeah. You could end with Like, him. he's kind of been there a bit longer. I mean, especially if you're going to do something with the Undertaker, like the Undertaker does an appearance with Kane. Sure. Yeah, I could see that ending the two go off to, you know, put their big fist in the air or something to end it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Do, I don't know, some shots of Jack together. Um, Kayla's with Bianca Belair. Uh, she cut a promo that last week she smacked the soul out of Sasha Banks' body and finally got to see the real, legit boss who will do whatever it takes without apologies. That's the version of Sasha Banks I want to face with no excuses for when I win the title and blames Carmella for all the drama with that sommelier Reginald and she's on her way to create history. So pretty much saying we're sorry for all the bullshit. We've got nine days... Eight days until this match, and we're going to do this for real now. And I th- can- I feel this match is probably going to end up closing the show. I-, I actually feel they will close with it. Ahead of Drew and Lashley, it's really hard for me to to say, because I personally think Drew and Lashley is hotter right now. Uh, but maybe, you know, and also because, like, it's a raw SmackDown deal. Like, maybe the, you know, night two, you're already closing with the SmackDown sh- match. Maybe you want to close night one with Raw, but I, I, I could still see it. By the time you're in the show, I don't think it necessarily matters so much. You know, there will be interest in this by the end of the show. It's also, if you look at it, like, I, I can certainly see the argument that, especially for this weekend, this, t- this you know, we don't know when we'll be in front of fans again of ending with big baby face wins on both nights. And you would argue that if the idea is keep the title on Lashley, um, this would be the match that you could flip the title to Bel Air and you get that, that big win. And it would be significant having the women go on last. So I think you, you look at mm-hmm. it from that perspective too. And the potential of ending both shows with Bel Air and Brian, or uh, you could have Lashley and uh, angry edge uh, winning. You could do that too. Anything can happen. And Vince comes out and says, we were just fine without you. Uh, Why didn't this sell out immediately like the UFC did? (laughs) Never coming back for you people. Um, Or it could be The Fiend closing the show. Yes, you could do that. Which which, which night is that? Is that the second night? I think that's night two. I think. Um, Carmella and Bianca Belair. uh, This started during the commercial break. Carmella was in control, tied the ponytail around the rope, uh, which, I mean, in a post, uh, he tagged Pliev world. I mean, this was a big deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. The stakes had been raised. Bel Air fired back with her comeback, teased whipping the ponytail, but then landed the forearm. Handspring standing moonsault missed. Super kick by Carmella, where she clearly was not slapping the thigh. Uh, and then Carmella missed with a kick and hit with the KOD in 241, and Bel Air wins. Banks showed up, uh, and Bel Air just like turned around, shoved her away, and said, "Not today, WrestleMania." And Sasha was like, "Granted, yeah, good idea." I came here all the way for nothing. Yeah, I went through my uh, yeah, I, I went tested. through the testing procedures. It's like, yeah, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this was uh, like, wow, what a what a waste I of my day. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well. Listen, I'm interested in the match on paper. I think these two uh, will do some tremendous work together. But man, I want a big segment been... next week. I want a big segment with these two to really just be just promos. That's it. 
unless they drop a surprise prime target between these two that they've been working on this entire time, I can't really see my hype for this one drastically improving with like nine days to go. But maybe they did. Maybe they had like Sean Ryan and Borash and all those guys secretly yeah, they've do been, a big they, thing. They've been working on it. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a close, like a, a television set is flickering and a wine glass tips over and smashes into a million pieces. Wow. That's just, that, that's just what's so aggravating about all this. They have, they hire, they pillage the best people from the indies who like do this incredible work promoting these things. And, um, you know, I understand it's like, those are kind of more like Triple H's hires, but man, you have WrestleMania here and you have like a build like this that really sorely need some of that extra material like they're, they're going to do for Cole and, and, and uh, O'Reilly. And unfortunately, we, we aren't going to get anything like that. <laughs> they continue to push tickets for WrestleMania with Corey Graves saying, you've been cooped up for the better part of a year. What better excuse to get out of the house and into the Tampa Bay weather than the grandest stage of them all? WrestleMania. You've been cooped up all year long. Why? Don't ask why. What better way than to hang out with 25,000 people? Yeah. You know, if only like the people administering vaccines could uh, get people to come out with the same type of, you know, enthusiasm and, and, uh, man. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's probably an awkward thing to try to get people to, pay money to come out to do stuff during a pandemic next week it's the fatal four way and this is our lineup way for the andre the giant memorial battle royal shinsuke nakamura king corbin jay uso ricochet mustafa ali murphy shelton benjamin cedric alexander elias jackson Riker, mace t-bar slapjack umberto carrillo akira tozawa Angel Garza, Grand Metalik, Lince Dorado, Eric, Kalisto, Drew Gulak, and Tucker. Which, dude, when Corey Graves reacted to this, best line of the whole night, a star-studded field. <laughs> Lost it. Star-studded. Te- technically, they're, like if you're an employee, you're a, you're a superstar, right? That's what they call everybody. Um, I, I mean, I think this is a positive, you know, and this is just a kind of a throwaway thing that you're going to put on the kickoff anyway. Leave it on the SmackDown. Decrease the show showtime. Not everybody should be on WrestleMania. Hey, it's fine. And, and apparently, you know, for then there's the tier of Aleister Black, who doesn't even qualify for this. That's true. Uh, nor Keith Lee, who is still away for, I guess, reasons we don't completely know yet. Yeah. Um, so... You know, yeah, there's circumstances for some that are just not available. What's your prediction, John? Who wins the Andre Battle Dude, Royal? this one, fucking wide open. Uh, place your bets. Literally anyone. And uh, the thing is, I can't see... Like, there's no one in here that, to me, jumps out as, like, this would matter. At, not that this, this winning this matters, but even, like, the logical theory of, like... Like, what's even your debate of, like, who goes over? Like, just pick someone. Yeah, like, Tucker. who's going to get any sort of push coming out of this? I don't think they will. Really. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe Nakamura, maybe. Uh, Corbin, I guess you can know. Didn't he? He already won one of these, didn't he? Um, I guess Ricochet, maybe? Could R-Truth get involved in this? And he ends of up course. winning it. Of course. Yeah. Anybody maybe can. R-Truth wins it. Sir. Maybe Logan. I think Logan Paul should be in this. Um, he probably wasn't there for these tapings, so that's probably not possible. Corbin cut a promo. He's tired of being disrespected. He's going to beat Drew McIntyre to headline WrestleMania. Tune in on He says he carried Drew for an entire year. Yeah. Okay. Um, Apollo Crews, he says, none of his Nigerian ancestors had ever been as disrespected as he was at Fastlane by Big E. And this finish we tried to pull off. So, we're going there. It is time for the first ever Nigerian drum fight. No rules, no limitations. Just a beating so loud that it sounds like a drum. So it sounds like a drum. 
<laughs> I rewound this three times to make sure I was hearing this properly. It's a beating so loud it sounds like a drum, and thus the Nigerian drum fight. Well, this will be a first for WrestleMania. I, I certainly felt like when you know they announced that this would be what Apollo's fifth time challenging for this belt, you probably needed some sort of stipulation. But I was thinking more like steel cage, um, bull rope. <laughs> I did not imagine a drum fight. I don't even know what that's going to be like, but it does sound very similar to a street fight. I could have seen Big E countering and offering a yappa pie strap match. Oh, that would be a hook. Yeah. Yappa pie. <laughs> a Nigerian drum fight. Do you think they'll make this a video game option? Yes, yes. <laughs> they should replace the corners with drums. So when you get Irish whipped into them, it uh, makes a drum sound effect. Well, why not make the whole ring a drum? Every every bump is a beat. Yes, yes. Um and you could uh, suffer a percussion from head trauma. Edge meets with Paul Heyman, and he uh, Heyman's going on that the main event should have been Reigns and Edge until that bastard Daniel Bryan inserted himself. Edge just cuts out of this promo. He's like, okay, cool. I don't know what you're planning for the triple threat. I've got commentary duty coming up. So it is the street fight main event with Edge seething on commentary. Um, they had a pretty physical match. Um by street fight standards, it involved the heavy utilization of a chair, uh, including Jay Uso wrapping it around Brian's ankle, then missing the Uso splash. Uh, Eddie Kingston was not as lucky. Reigns comes out with Heyman to set up the commercial break. Edge is putting over Jay, saying that Reigns needs him more than Jay needs Reigns. He is main event Jay Uso. Brian gets rammed into the chair in the corner. Uso splashes hit. Brian kicks out of that. They battle on the steps with Brian suplexing Jay to the floor. And then Brian gets the chair, attacks Jay, and then rams Jay's head into the desk right in front of Edge. And back in the ring, he wraps a chain around his forearm, delivers these downward elbows, applies the yes lock, and Jay Uso submits. In 13 minutes and 6 seconds, Brian goes down to the floor and then drills Edge with a running knee at the desk before he rams Edge's head into the post. Um... Uh, before we talk about the end, uh, what did you think about the street fight? You know, it was no drum match, but I thought it was a pretty decent street fight. I And I think it did its point of showing off a new side of Brian. They were definitely trying to give him the uh, give him an edge um, as he just destroyed the man here in the post-match. And then he went after Reigns. Roman launched this office chair and missed Brian. Uh, Brian hit the running knee and then applied the yes lock. On to Reigns, and Pierce and the other officials come out, and <laughs> did you catch Roman's line uh, that he gave that at Fastlane, he was not tapping out, he was trying to communicate to Paul Heyman using Morse code. <laughs> Amazing. That's funny. Michael Cole had a really great line at the end, given the day. He said, it's been a good Friday for Daniel Bryan, but will it be a good Sunday for Bryan at WrestleMania. Will the resurrection of Edge occur on Sunday? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, because it's you know, they, they, they didn't have Roman tapping this time, and I thought that was good. Like, I thought they accomplished the point here, and I think now it teases the close of this match at the pay-per-view being Brian tapping Roman out. Gives me something to look forward to. I think this is going to be a really interesting match, and I think you can make a lot of arguments. I think it's one of those matches where you can make arguments for all three to go over, and I think that's always a strong dynamic for a match. I think you could argue all three in different uh, scenarios. I think the strongest is for a title change. I think Reigns is uh, the toughest to argue, but not completely out of the realm of possibility either. I, I think that this is definitely the strongest match going into next weekend. I think it's had the best build so far. Yeah. But hey, we have not finished all the TV and that Nigerian drum fight could surprise people with the go home segments next week. Could steal the show. Yeah, possibly. What'd you think of the show tonight? Definitely a mixed bag. Um, I, I will say, you know, I think these shows have done a good job of just 
create like they've they've been intensely focused on the matches that have been coming up so it doesn't feel like there's much wasted time no kind of you know senseless segments uh everything has a point and um yeah it was you know decently entertaining for the most part it was no falcon or winter soldier was it it was not no not this was week. it a good episode it? this week no i haven't it was seen very, it. it was very good yes well, let's uh, open up the phone lines, and we're open to any subjects you want to discuss tonight on the forum at forum.postwrestling.com. Tonight's show getting a 5 out of 10, so a pass. Let's go to Hanzi, first of all. Hanzi, what's going on? What's going on? Yo, first, uh, I got some good news. I, I got vaccinated today, Ben. Oh, congratulations, Hanzi. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, I know, man. Yeah, I know. It was, it was, it was a really... I, I mean, so far, um, I... They told me that uh, you might feel body aches or um, or you might have a fever, but I I have no symptoms so far. So so far so good. So if anyone out there that's like kind of like iffy about it, I'm just kind of giving my like ex- experience. So hopefully more people get vaccinated. But um, that's coming from Hansi, the most skeptical person that ever calls into this show. So if he's saying <laughs> that, that's, uh, a reliable opinion. Yeah. Um, well, SmackDown. I I. I I guess it put some of the matches still into motion. I I just feel like at least on the SmackDown end, I'm more excited for the SmackDown matches than I am from the Raw matches. Uh, except for the obviously Lashley and Drew has been pretty good, but I just thought like I, I like when Daniel Bryan does uh, like he becomes like really really aggressive because I, I I always think that he uh, baby faces always seem like like they're pushovers. And I always like when Daniel Bryan, like he, he feels justified in attacking both these guys. So that was cool. Um, but the question I, I wanted to ask is what, what AW um, with, with, Co- with Cody, with Cody and, uh, and the, the QT Marshall thing, do you guys think it was like too soon to like debut a new group that like, I, unless they're going to try to do most of this on like dark or something like that. I just, I just don't, I hope this doesn't take, into a higher billing than the pinnacle versus the inner circle, because it's going to be like one of those, because there's internet fans that are annoyed with Cody. They think that he has to like, kind of have his own faction war, something really important. And I understand Cody needing a, a big feud sometimes because, you know, he can't really do a world title thing, but do you guys think that like this feud will kind of take away from the pinnacle and inner circle? And I'll just leave you guys with that. Good job. I'm looking forward to tomorrow for podcast. And hopefully I'll catch all the podcasts. Thank you guys. All right. Thanks a lot, Hansi. Um, it's Cody's angle. So, I mean, that it's going to be a, a featured story. I, I don't buy into the idea that it's just, uh, you know, two groups feuding that it's somehow like that's, you can have two very distinct feuds, uh, even though it's, it's made up of factions at a war with one another. I think this is a bit of a different slant that this is, you know, these students of Cody that have rebelled against him. Um, uh, but it'll certainly be b- borne out um, in terms of you know the the way that they progress with the feud. It's very important with this follow up. Uh, I think even more so for that angle because you're talking about less established players than you have in the inner circle and the pinnacle. That you don't want to do a big angle like this with Cody and QT and those associated, and then w- we don't hear from them for three or four weeks. That's I- I'm not against the idea that you that you have to that you can't have people off for one week and then you revisit this story week three. But sometimes we see that at times with AEW where something gets launched and then it's out of sight, out of mind, and you you almost forget about it. And I think the big one, or at least one of them, has been this Daniels and Kazarian story that it exists on dark, but I think you're you're really missing your core audience when you're not doing frequent uh, updates, at least, on Dynamite and and piecing that story along when it was executed so well at the beginning. Yeah. I don't really understand any sort of complaint that, you know, this is Cody somehow um, taking spotlight away. In fact, I think this is a story where it's using Cody Rhodes' star power to provide to his students and to the younger next generation that's out there giving spotlights to people like Lee Marshall and uh, you know, I guess uh, Lee Lee Johnson. I'm sorry. 
Who am I thinking? Tiger <laughs> Lee Marshall Tony, is Tony the Tiger. Is, uh, Tony the Tiger. Uh, rest in peace. <laughs> Lee Johnson. Yeah, so I, I don't really get those complaints. I mean, I think this is going to be, yeah, it's another stable feud, but I see this more as sort of like, you know, the Teen Titans taking on like the Young Avengers, you leave the Justice League and the Avengers to the main event. You know, you're not going to be doing a potential blood and guts match with this particular feud, but you can with the main event, with a pinnacle and, and inner circle. So you can have stable warfare you know, up and down the card uh, i think it's just a way to organize you know a a a, 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 a selection of of your roster let's go up next to nick nick what's happening what's going on guys happy friday happy friday yes wait did you listen to much marvin gay today oh man um you know it, it, i i hear it it, it was a great it, the Trouble Man is a great um, reflection of the African American experience. That's also yes. what I heard. Funny, funny, yeah. funny about that. Yeah, I I thought the SmackDown was serviceable. If anything, I think I was reading some of the quotes from Triple H's media call today, where at the end he said like his preference was always going to be for NXT to focus on long term storylines and building storylines like that. And I think it's something similar to what he said in the past as well. And also watching AEW felt like such a breath, uh, breath of fresh air this week. Just considering the action on that show is so diverse and they really make sure to pay off every single little tidbit that they, that they leave you with. And I'm looking at this Mania card and on paper, I want to really like it because there's so many people who I think have really worked hard to get the opportunity to have their first Mania singles match like Cesaro. Like I don't think Sami Zayn has ever had a WrestleMania singles match and like Apollo Crews. But I'm mm-hmm. just wondering if like, if on paper we know the card is going to be good. And WWE obviously knows that all of these wrestlers that they have are talented. And with them trying to just jumble this card together, like obviously the bulk of it has been made in the past three or so weeks. And with them trying to appeal more broadly on Peacock, how much do you guys think, and this is, I don't think there's a real answer to this, honestly. This is just something that I'm kind of thinking about. How much does a WrestleMania build on TV really matter anymore? Which does a build matter? Yeah. I think it's still like, you're still talking about an event that it is, it is the show of the year that you're going to track the most. Uh, I would say non, you know, week to week viewers that are going to just come in for the name of the show. But I would say for your, your ardent audience, I think like you certainly want a stronger build versus a non-existent one. I think that you can look at, at this one where I, I would certainly not say that you just, you know, throw the towel in on your TV and that the show, the, the stories don't matter going in. I think that, I think that's going to greatly enhance people's overall interest in the product and whether it's reaching enough people that they're going to come back. I can't, I don't think you can just simply rely on people coming back and watching the show because aiming for that audience, that's also the audience that isn't going to be around two weeks later at at the same time. I think that's definitely true, especially since there's not many, you know, part-timers quote unquote on this show. Yeah. Nothing this year. I mean, the, your, your biggest one would be Shane McMahon of like, who's represented on these cards. Like this is as, as much of a everyday roster uh, card as WrestleMania has had in years. I I think it matters for the sheer fact that like you want to use the biggest show of the year to give the audience your most compelling storylines so that you can create the most compelling TV shows that will make them want to come back week after week after week. Like the momentum behind the name brand of WrestleMania is far more valuable than simply that one single night. It puts a spotlight on your entire product for potentially like three to four months. And this year, like we've we've been seeing sort of like the the dwindling effect of that brand name, you know, over the years where it, after Rumble, it really doesn't feel that exciting anymore. And I think a, a large part of that is because of weak television, too much TV, perhaps. So I, I definitely think it still matters, at least for that reason, if not more. Yeah, I definitely think it still matters. But like John was saying, it just feels like they have somewhat like thrown in the towel on on TV and especially with what they're doing on Raw with Rhea Ripley and Asuka, that just kind of being, obviously there was outside circumstances involved in in that match, but also the Drew McIntyre and Bobby build being more about the Hurt business, it does kind of feel a little bit scattershot and it just kind of like felt like they, they put together a card and then the storyline progression came after they, they put the card together on paper. 
I think they're always trying. You know, I yeah. don't think it's ever their intent to like create bad TV, but often it just becomes that way. So I don't know if it's ever like, you know, them just giving up or just. No, somehow... I, I will say like in, in that company, like one, you, you cannot say that there are people that like you work at this pace and putting this amount of TV together. Like there are people that work an insane amount and yeah. it's, it's, it's sometimes a very frustrating uh, environment to be in because things can change on a whim and that are completely out of your control. And I'm sure in the lead up uh, to this year's mania, I think that you can look at probably many of those examples of things that were completely out of their control and things that we know publicly, like with Charlotte Flair and what has led to, you know, her not being attached to this card as of yet. And probably many other issues, Oscar getting injured. Like there's just, and all of the COVID stuff it's, I'm sure this year was, probably the most difficult mania to put together because every week was a crapshoot of this person might not be available. And let's not forget that these shows are live. Who is to mm -hmm. say that these cards are intact next weekend? Like that's, that's the world we're living in that these things are out of your control. Yeah. I couldn't imagine being a, a writer on the production crew of WWE these past three weeks, but yeah, that's just kind of been what's on my mind this past week. Thank you guys so much as always and really best of luck to you guys tomorrow and to the entire Post family. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick, as always. Let's go to Muggin up next. Hello, hello again. Anyway. Hey, Muggin. Um, what's, up? what's up? Good. Um, I was wondering with, um, from, with the media call, Triple H said that TakeOver Night 1 was going to be commercial free on Peacock. Yep. Do you think that, do you think it will drive drive viewers who, all, who don't have the, who don't have the subscription to uh, watch that instead of a USA uh, version yes i do i if if i was someone that was interested in watching this card next wednesday and did not have peacock and that was an option looking at this card and the fact that i mean you would be likely if you're a fan getting it anyway for wrestlemania 100 percent, i would be watching it on peacock over usa if it was commercial free there, there's so many things like it's not just the the you know commercial free nxt but like you're getting so much of, of this other stuff they're really making it a stupid decision like i wonder if they're going to do ads like they used to do for the network are you an idiot why are you paying full price for this thing when you can pay 9.99 like do you think we're, we're going to get like the same type of treatment for people why are you watching this on the usa network are you dumb yeah, well it's actually <laughs> the opposite now it's like why would you watch this for free when you could pay for this streaming service? Well, I, I think mean, the I next best getting... thing would I think the next best thing would be like you know the USA the USA cut would be uh, with limited commercial interruption. I mean, I can't say the same for you know for Canada because you know sports that is uh, we just got the deal, so I don't I don't know that Canada's going to get that same kind of thing. And uh, as far as SmackDown is concerned, I mean, I'm a lot more convinced about the Universal title program than I was the week before. I mean. Everybody like like everybody. It's an arms race at this point between Edge, Roman, and uh, and Daniel. Like you, like ending the second night with a, with Daniel Bryan possibly winning would be would be, would be a feel good ending. But I mean, like it, it's very much a toss up over who's going to win it. Yeah, and it I is. think that's that's an intriguing part of of the match. So it's you know it should be. I think it's going to be a really strong match to, to end the whole weekend with. And yeah, I think you're going to have that intrigue of, of who wins. So I, I think they're going to, you know, hit a home run with this match. It would be very hard to see this not working uh, for that crowd that night, but uh, we'll see. I think that it's, it's not hyperbole to say that it's, it's a total crapshoot of how an audience is going to react like that. Like you've heard like the interviews this week that edge has done. I don't, I don't disagree that you just, you you can think a certain way, but it's you, you don't know till you go out there what what the reaction will be like and how you how you book a card as well with finishes that is going to best serve your your audience and and peak for a two night event with this title match. It's pretty poetic that it's going to be on the ten year anniversary of his initial retirement. Hmm. Crazy! It's Thank crazy you. how all three men. Okay, I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> no, we heard you. We heard you. Yeah, it's poetic. Um, 10 years. Wow. I didn't realize. Until April 11th, 2011 was when Edge retired. Oh, okay. Almost to the day. Uh, thank you, Muggin. Appreciate the call. Uh, let's go up next to Ben. Ben, are you there? Hey guys, how's it going? Hi, Ben. Hey, Ben. Happy, uh, happy Good Friday. 
Thank uh, you. I don't know if Good Friday was a, was a happy uh, c- celebration, but uh, here we oh, are not? nonetheless. Yeah. Good well, Friday, let's, let's, good, yeah. let's get into the swing of things, as Cesaro said. Um, yes. Just just got two things. Um, what's the status of Bailey? Uh, like she hasn't been on TV for a long time, um, and like she has nothing planned for Mania. So just the status of Bailey, and then secondly. Um, what have you guys heard about the possible relaunch of uh, Lucha Underground? Uh, um, they have that Azteca Underground thing going on on uh, MLW, and it kind of seems like I read some stuff that uh, Conan and Court Bauer might have something going on. So maybe if you have any info on that, that'd be I'd love to hear. Uh, with Bailey, I, I don't know what the issue is that she's been off for for quite a while. I think it's really notable that she is you know, it's a glaring omission that she hasn't been on TV. You would think, I mean, next week's TV, which again, it's been taped. I think those are the two big questions. Do Charlotte and Bailey have roles at WrestleMania, Uh, whether it's inserting Charlotte into the title match on raw, or like if Bailey was available, you just throw those two together as just, just a cold match. Um, But if not, I mean, that would be, you know, those would be those are the only two names I really have questions about whether they're going to be on this card or not. Uh, the Lucha Underground stuff, like that's all within like MLW and the story that they're that they've been presenting for months now with this Azteca Underground and the idea of the reveal of uh, El Jefe that they've been uh, promoting. So that that's what that story is. It's like it's it's connected to the MLW storyline with Azteca Underground. Thank you very much, Ben, for the call. Let's go up next to Brian. Brian, what's up? Hey, guys. Good evening. Uh, good show tonight, as always. And uh, since this is a show for all listeners, free of charge, uh, I'd like to recommend the most recent episode of the Rocky Mind via Picture Show, where myself, Nate Milton, and Daniel Perry talk about Moana and a lot of good stuff. Uh, as for SmackDown tonight... Very well uh, done. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, as for SmackDown tonight, I thought... It was one of the better shows I've seen in weeks, mainly because of the build around Reigns versus Edge versus Brian and that main event. Uh, but there were a bunch, few clunker uh, interviews and promos. And I also, but I did enjoy the one inset promo by the Street Profits where they kind of uh, expressed disappointment by being stuck on the uh, SmackDown WrestleMania special as opposed to WrestleMania itself, just going, oh, we're on the pregame? Wow. And then they just segued over. Um, mm-hmm. But I uh, want to slide back to Wednesday shows and uh, hallelujah, no more head to heads very soon. Uh, I already expressed uh, some of my thoughts in forum.postwrestling.com about Dynamite. Uh, as well done as it was, I thought the Inner Circle attack on the pinnacle, I thought, came way too soon in the story. I thought they w- could have waited a few more weeks. I think it also could benefit from being in front of like more of a live crowd, as much of a live crowd as they can get. It's still nicely shot, but it just seems like it was almost too much, uh, too much that they got on the pinnacle. So I'm not really sure like what the destination will be. Whether uh, they'll have a big five on five match at in May and uh, like double or nothing, or if uh, they have a plan intended for bl- the eventual blunt guts show in Newark in the summer. So I'm curious about yeah, your I thoughts mean, on that. And also, also, uh, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, first, uh, just on that point, I mean, it's all dependent on the follow up, right? Yeah. Personally, I, 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 I could see, you know, uh, maybe this should have been saved for a live audience. Um, at the same time, doing what they did, I don't think anybody, at least I didn't complain about the way that they did it. Um, certainly, I feel like the the first time the inner circle met with the pinnacle after the beatdown and the turn the first time, it was going to be some sort of physical confrontation. Um, the intensity of, bo- of both segments, I thought, was strong enough that in the end, this feels like it's a heated feud that I still want to see more of. So I wouldn't say that they've extinguished it. It's one a piece now, and we await to see what sort of matches they're they're going to build coming out of it. Okay. And uh, my last question about uh, concerning AEW, uh, I'm I'm happy for everyone involved in that main event, the Arcade Anarchy. I thought that was very well done. Uh, but where does Miro go from here? Because I think he's like the biggest main event act in that in that group of that main event, and. 
I'm not sure if he's hit that's if he's his ceiling already, just being this character himself. So I'm just curious what your thoughts on him would be for the future. And uh, so that's all from me. Thank you. And happy post podcast day. Thank you, Brian, as always. Thanks, Brian. Um, I think now's the time you have Miro just destroy Kip Sabian uh, and blame him for the loss. And you just let him be this monster. Now I would kill the gamer stuff. I think that's death for him. I like, I sometimes it's, you know, you, you, you enhance uh, natural characteristics and it can work when it's an extension of yourself. Um, sometimes not. And I think Miro is one of those, he's a naturally very funny individual, but I think all the gamer stuff to me is just uh, going nowhere. I think that there's a very clear path of how to utilize this guy and Brian kind of outlined it. And that would be my direction with him is just eliminating him, uh, Kip Sabian from that act and, and, go your new direction with Miro because he could be a, a super effective heel uh, at a higher level on that show. Yeah. I think you separate him from this point on, uh, you know, like they, they still have yet to do, I guess your orange Cassidy Miro singles match, but I don't even really care to see that anymore because this last arcade anarchy match felt like such a big blow off and felt like such a successful blow off that, yeah. You know, what What do you do afterwards? You know, how do you book that match, um, t- you know, to feel satisfying? Because, like, if you have Miro in, you're going to want to see Orange Cassidy maybe get some revenge. If you have Orange Cassidy win, well, where does that leave Miro, you know, losing in a singles bout? So I think he moves on from this, and he goes after Darby's TNT title. You know, that is, I think, the perfect next step for him, and that match should be spectacular. All righty, let's go up next to MJ. MJ from MJ, what's going on? Let's see if I can unmute myself this time. Yes, you did. I can hear you. Hi. Well, I just wanted to check in. It's been a few weeks. Um, wish you guys all the best tomorrow in your uh, post podcast day. I think it's extremely cool what you guys are doing. Um, you guys, it's been great for Mania last year, and I have no doubt that you guys are going to knock it out of the park this year. So uh, happy to see a uh, another big milestone for you guys. Thank well, you. Thank you, MJ. Much appreciated. Nice to hear from you. Um, tuned in the last few uh, episodes, Raw and SmackDown, caught the last hour of both. Um, trying to get like into WWE again. I stopped following for a little while, except through you guys. I'm looking forward to Mania, but what I'm not looking forward to is like what comes after they're in front of a live audience. Like I think there's going to be a lot of fan reactions that we may be surprised by or maybe even expect in terms of who people will cheer for. And then what's it like when we go back to the dome and it's all canned and kind of really produced because after a few weeks away, that's what's like stuck out to me is how produced it feels that they're like generating these reactions. Um, the yes chant tonight was as loud as I've ever heard it. Yeah, they did really have some stuff like cranked up tonight. I think it's less, I would say that if it was like the, the, the performance center, I think that would be way more of um of an adjustment than the Thunderdome. But I understand what you're saying, especially with you know two nights where it's going to feel as close to a real wrestling environment as people ha- have had uh, a chance to really have since you know outside of you know the, like some of the Japanese products. But I I think that it's something where I mean it's it's just the reality of the situation. It's like, there's, it's out of their control to, I'm sure if they had their way, they'd be able to do it in front of fans. But I think for the time being, it's, it's going to be this way for, for a long time. Do you know if there's anything preventing them from doing it? I mean, the UFC, I know you're covering, they're doing shows in Jacksonville in front of this is WWE's call. Like they're like, this is their call. They, there's no restrictions in Florida from them running, uh, a pay-per-view the next month in the same arena UFC is doing and trying to sell 15,000 tickets. So, so it's so it's on WWE. Yeah. I've been thinking about this um, from the business standpoint, like what it means for them to get back on the road as like a reopening thing. I wonder if because of how they were classified as an essential business and the, maybe anything they had to do to get those permits to be filming that they might be bound to a, to some kind of deal where they can't, they have to film in the state. They have to rent space, something like that. Or if any of the networks are telling them they want them to continue to produce shows this way. Um, th- those are just two thoughts I've had about what might be keeping them from doing it. Uh, I, I don't see how it would necessarily be. I mean, for, I mean, if you were the state of Florida, I think you would like, um, you know, Florida is encouraging 
uh, different operations to have fans and such. I think another aspect of this is that unlike UFC, who have just run shows at the apex, um, WWE, they have invested heavily in this Thunderdome. So I think that they're also looking at it fr- from that perspective. It's the combination of going back to fans. It's running weekly as opposed to, you know, UFC that's going to do one pay-per-view per month and they're going to different states that I I would not be suggesting like running Raw and SmackDown every week inside Florida and like you're just you're not going to draw for for any s- sustained period of time. Like that is that's a struggle that AEW is going through uh, biweekly and we're even seeing it like with with WrestleMania, not to say that, you know, ticket sales are poor, but it's it was not the automatic sellout that people were curious if there would be that that first time that wwe's running a big show thank you very much mj for the call let's go up next to nab nab what's up what's going on guys uh just wanted to uh confirm that well well not confirm but i just looked it up it, nxt takeover day one will be airing in wwe on the wwe network here in canada commercial free on wednesday so that should be kind of cool. But I do have a question related to TakeOver. Obviously, during these TakeOvers that take place before Mania, we see a lot of call-ups afterwards. I'm just curious just to understand if there's any wrestlers that you guys could see being called up after Mania. And uh, just on the Austin Jericho Broken Skull Sessions, um, I know it's probably highly unlikely we'll see any more AEW talent, or we could, but... Um, just, just wanted to, under, you know, just, just to get, get your guys' thoughts on who you think would be sort of other guests that Austin could look into getting. Like the automatic one for me comes as CM Punk. I feel like that automatically makes sense as someone that would do the show and would, would get some buzz, especially on Peacock. But yeah, that's all I had. Yeah, Punk to me is like a no-brainer that I think there'd be no hang-up in, in doing that one at all. Like, I expect them to do that at that at some point. And I'm sure there'll be interest in, in that if if they were to go that direction. But yeah, that's I, I'm sure those are like the kinds of guests you could uh, expect there. Um, in terms somebody of in call- the chat, Somebody in the chat room su- suggested Jim Ross as a possibility. Yeah, um, maybe. Um, I mean, you're, you're looking for ones that are going to uh, get a lot of buzz attached to them. Like, I, I really don't see this being some like opening the floodgates kind of uh, scenario where there's going to be a plethora of people with AEW coming on the WWE network. I think this is a unique set of circumstances. The two guys push for it and it's an experiment to try something out um, with with really no risk involved when you think about it. Uh, Call ups. Is there anyone that jumps out at you way that uh, might be? Uh, moving on, or do you think that with the move over to establishing a new night that they're going to try and keep this NXT roster in place rather than losing people? Yeah, I mean, depending on the result of uh, the women's championship match, I could see either, you know, EO or Raquel getting called up. Maybe more likely EO. Um, because... Karrion Cross is one with me that I would be really interested to see. Like, if he lost to Balor... Um, that would be an interesting one to see if they or could Balor make a jump back. You could. I, I, I think he really works in, in NXT. I but um again, like they could look at it at this point that hey, you were moved down there for a specific reason, and that reason no longer exists on Wednesday nights, and you've been down there for a year and a half. So let's bring you back up to the main roster. That's possible. Yeah. Uh all right. Thank you very much for the call, Nav. Let's go to New Jersey. Brandon, thank you for waiting. What's going on? Hello. Hi. Hey, what's up, man? How are you? You got all your fingers intact? (laughs) Yeah, shout out Keith Texia, man. He was a good wrestler, man. Uh, He lost to Jake Barner in the uh, the American in the 2012 Olympic Games, man. But uh, yeah, tough dude, too, man. I saw that fight last night. I was... uh, Pretty gnarly on on flight that. Uh, uh, I I would recommend looking at that picture. You 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 would you would have a uh, you would go through some things in the toilet if you saw that. I think everyone's seen the photo by now. It was everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, uh, I just want to give a shout out to that uh, Rwanda Rwanda way with uh, Brian Coleman. Uh, 
I love Brian Pillman personally. And I read the book, Crazy Like a Fox, tremendous book. But uh, I mean, I didn't know about that one to nine hundred number that you uh, you were talking about during the uh, during the show. Like, because I remember, dude, dude you would have blown all your money on that one nine hundred line if you were <laughs> watching that ninety six. I know you would have. It was so weird because I remember he was go- he had left WCW and he was at ECW and then he crashed uh, a WCW pay per view and he was wearing uh, a nine hundred a- uh, shirt. Yeah. Yeah, and he had Hogan with that that chair, mm-hmm. and uh, I was blown. Away. I was I was wild stuff, man. And uh, shout out to Keyshawn. He sounded like Mark Pavlich with the uh, with the uh, the right all the time during the interview. He sounded. Like, it reminded me of the Mark Pavlich <laughs> interview with Jordan Green back in the day, right? <laughs> right? 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 What happened but, to that uh, guy? Yeah. <laughs> guys, guys, I run the greatest organization in this <laughs> entire country. <laughs> I always liked Mark Pavlich. I always enjoyed chatting with that guy quite a lot. Shout out Maxwell Fighting Championship. <laughs> MFC. Uh, w- w- uh, w- two things that I'll get out of here. Uh, uh, what, did you, what do you think of Jimmy Smith doing uh, NXT, uh, the, the pre-show for, uh, for the upcoming, uh, what, what's, the, what's the show called? Uh, the pre-show? The, yeah, the pre-show. But the, the pay- <laughs> what did they call the that thing before the main show? Yeah, the takeover. Uh, I guess there was only one. Uh, there was only room for one guy in the UFC that can wear the fitted uh, dress shirts, right? Joe Rogan. Uh, well, Jimmy Smith. I mean, he even confirmed it this week. Like he he did an audition with them. So I don't know if this is a sign that he's coming in uh, full time or or what. But I mean, he's definitely been on WWE's radar. That's interesting. Uh, also, from the Rwanda, you were talking about Reebok pumps. I own the pair. I had, I had a, I had a pair of the white and the the green ones, and I thought I could dunk, so I put them onto the basketball court, oh, no. pumped them up like you wouldn't believe. I got the ball and I was dribbling, dribbling, and dribbling, head fake, everything. I did a spin move. I jumped in the air. I didn't I didn't dunk. I hit the pavement. <laughs> 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 okay hey brandon are you are you busy right now no not really what's up do you want to help us take our next call sure all right uh brandon why don't you introduce our next caller is it who i think it is is it is it the man the myth the legend is it Stephen K? that was a weird pronunciation I'm sorry, I, I tried. <laughs> All the characters coming out late at night. <laughs> the freaks come out at night, right, John? No, but boys, it's really nice to talk to you. Like, it's so nice to talk to you guys. Like, you know. Uh, and uh, Steffi K, how did it feel? How did it feel during Cesaro's promo tonight to realize that you're not the worst singer to perform on a Friday night? <laughs> that was actually wicked. Like, I needed that. Thank you, John. But, With all due uh, respect to the spin doctors. Absolutely. And uh, I wanted to say to you guys, like, um, I apologize for last week because, like, I, my login got uh, hacked, obviously. And I hired a, a personal investigator uh, who's my cousin, Sheldon. He's wicked. And um, he looked into it, and it was either, like, Victoria, Texas, or Los Angeles. So... Uh, either way, that was not Steppy Tay last week, and I, I apologize for that. Well, I really I, did. I guess he was he was trying to dial uh, and contact another Canadian by way of Manhasset, New York, and he ended up calling in here. I think so, Pollock. Yeah, I think we'll, so. we'll send him some emojis in in response. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, my question for the boy is here tonight: um, What do you think is next for Christian Cage in AEW? And I have a few possibilities that I just scratched down. Uh, somebody like a Scorpio Sky, maybe a Sammy Guevara, maybe a Sean Spears, uh, even Pac. Uh, I don't know, or Seidel, or or uh, this is where we is say this, goodnight to Brandon. Is this your usual <laughs> voice, Steppy Tay? Like, is or is, like, are you throwing us off? This is like a very serious. Yeah. No, I is think, this I a new, think a, I, new uh, accent you're trying out. What's going on? It's nothing. I'm trying. <laughs> Uh, waiting. Uh, I live in Newfoundland. <laughs> Moffat, what are you? 
This is very subtle this week. I, I wasn't really sure if this was like a new shtick or, or just oh, a new real friend. voice. Um, this is my honest self. All right. Well, can you ask the question again? This is like the the Twilight Zone with. Did you actually not get the question? Those are the tick. I just want to hear you read the names again. Oh, uh, so what's next for Christian? I loved this match with Frankie Kazarian. I loved it. I thought it was deadly. I thought it was wicked. Like I thought it was fucking deadly. Uh, But like, what's next for him? Okay, we're gonna take your question off the air. I, for the sake of all the listeners, we we need to just end this. This is just uh, this is like a mind warp here of like the the insanity that is. Uh, uh, okay, love well, you thank too, you guys. Like- uh, thank you all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, anyway, um, Christian. Uh, yeah, Christian. I think for the time being, you don't have to race this guy into a story. I think you can just put this guy out and have. A lot of interesting matches with people that he's never worked with before. Do that for a month. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just throwing off by, by that accent. I, I didn't even pay attention to the question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Christian, who Christian's going to Way agrees with? with me. Yes. Sure. You don't think... Uh, you, uh, thank you, guys. I uh, hope we talk to you all next week. We have one piece of feedback from the forum, and that is from Kate. Here to actually put some order into this show. Kate says... I really liked both the eight-man match and the main event tonight. And as forced as the women's tag team run-ins were, I thought it made most of the participants look really good. Better than anything else that's happened in the build-up to this title defense. The worst thing about the show was actually seeing the list of participants in the Andre Battle Royal. The idea that Jackson, Riker, and Elias are on the same level as Ricochet and Nakamura is pretty ridiculous. The weirdest inclusion, though, has to be Corbin, who is fighting Drew on Monday for the chance to replace him in the main event at Mania, but won't even make it on the show if he loses. Please explain this to me like I'm in kindergarten because I don't understand. Um, that's a tall task. Well, I suppose he has a chance to main event WrestleMania, but if he fails, well, this is his backup. Well, I mean, this doesn't really interfere with WrestleMania. I mean, he could uh, warm up in the Andre Battle Royal to get set for headlining the show on Saturday. Yeah, sure. That's about as much thought as I think we want to give... Um, I think, uh, that's it, John. Well, on that note, I want to thank all the callers, a uh, wide range of them tonight, all, all calling in tonight. And that's going to be it. We're going to be back in a big way in several hours. In fact, in 12 hours time, we are going to be back noon Eastern with post podcast day. We hope that many of you listening will be, uh, hopping aboard the post wrestling cafe. $6 gets you in the door. You're going to get that value. You got that value just in those last two phone calls. Uh, I think so. Absolutely. We have more people wanting to speak up, including a WH Park impersonator that we're probably going to take off air. Uh, so every Friday, everybody, we're wind to smack down live for all patrons. And we hope you join us for the rest of the month. So much coming out on the Post Wrestling Cafe. But most importantly, tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, Post Podcast Day be there everybody i'm going to send a link to all the patrons uh right after this show just click on the zoom link and join us so who knows what's going to happen only one way to find out we'll speak with you all at noon for post podcast day